Well, there was a chauvinistic husband and his godly wife who were preparing to have breakfast when the wife asked the question, why do I always have to make the coffee? The husband answered, because you're the wife. That's your job. And the wife replied, well, the Bible doesn't say it's the woman's job to make the coffee. It's the man's. And taken back by this, the husband demands to see where in the Bible it states that he should be the one to make the coffee. Well, here it is, the godly woman replied, Hebrews. Take that. (sighs) So we are celebrating, acknowledging, remembering Black History Month because February is Black History Month. And it was wonderful to do some research on where this celebration originated. And it was called National African American History Month also. It's an annual uh, celebration of achievements by black Americans and a time for recognizing the central role of African Americans in US history. It was created out of the vision of historian, scholar, educator, and publisher Carter G. Woodson in 1926. Woodson dedicated himself to the field of African American history, working to make sure that the subject was taught in schools and studied by scholars. For his efforts, Woodson is often called the father of black history. Black History Month became a month-long celebration in 1976. And since 1976, every US president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. The month of February was chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, who was born into slavery, escaped at age 20 and went on to become a world-renowned anti-slavery activist, author, and orator. So as a way to celebrate this focus, today especially, we are, I am going to bring into our focus some very courageous change agents who were committed to human rights and freedom and were willing to take a stand for what they knew was right, what they knew they deserved and what they knew was possible, and they would stop at nothing to have that vision be a reality. And there were so many, as I did research, I was just so moved by so many souls who were willing to take a stand during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s in our country. And I want to highlight some of them as a way to honor their stand and to learn from their courage, their vision, their strength, and their faith, and their commitment to nonviolent action as a means to facilitate change. So here, and there are many, but here are the ones that came to my heart to share with you today. Baptist minister and social activist, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, was a key leader in the civil rights movement in the United States. He sought equality for African Americans, those disadvantaged economically and victims of injustice. He sought to make change through peaceful, nonviolent protest. Through the power of his impeccable command of the spoken and written word, his fierce faith, strength, and courage, he led a movement that changed the world. He was instrumental in the formation of the Montgomery bus boycott and the March on Washington, which helped bring about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. He was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. He is remembered each year on Martin Luther King Jr. Day a U.S. federal holiday since 1986. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks is primarily known for refusing to give up her seat to a white man on a city bus in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama. 
When asked if she was tired that day as a reason for not giving up her seat, she replied that she was not tired or old, but that she was tired of giving in. Her nonviolent act of protest was a foundational piece in the initiation of the civil rights movement in the United States. She also was an active member of the NAACP and worked diligently for voters' rights. And as a result of taking this stand, she and her husband lost their jobs and were forced to move to Detroit to start a new life. Rosa Parks became nationally recognized as a symbol of dignity and strength as she took a stand to end racial segregation and assure equality for all. In 1999, she was named in Time Magazine as one of the top most influential people of the 20th century and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Medgar Evans was a nonviolent activist in the civil rights movement from Mississippi who was a World War II veteran and a college graduate who worked to gain admission for African Americans to the state-supported public university of Mississippi. He worked tirelessly for voting rights and registration, economic opportunity, access to public facilities, and other changes in the segregated society in which he lived. He was the first field secretary for the NAACP, which meant he helped organize boycotts and set up new local chapters. Medgar was assassinated at his home by a white supremacist. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors with over 3,000 people attending. His wife said this about him. Medgar was a man who never wanted adoration, who never wanted to be in the limelight. He was a man who saw a job that needed to be done, and he answered the call and the fight for freedom, dignity, and justice, not just for his people, but for all people. And one other person that inspired me was Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was an African-American journalist and activist who led an anti-lynching crusade in the U.S. in the 1890s. She was born into slavery before the Emancipation Proclamation. After the Emancipation, she moved to Tennessee to live with her aunt after her parents died from yellow fever. She went to college and became a teacher. She refused to give up her first class seat on a train to a white man 70 years before Rosa Parks. She was thrown off the train, sued the railroad, won the suit, but it was later overturned. She then began to write about race issues and civil injustices in the South. Because of this, she was fired as a teacher and went into journalism full time. She created a newspaper that was her forum to write about these issues. In 1892 in Memphis, three men were lynched, defending their store against an attack by whites. The owner of the store was her friend. She became enraged at this injustice and wrote about it in the newspaper. Her newspaper was subsequently burned to the ground and her life was threatened. Ida Wells went on to help establish civil rights organizations and toured internationally speaking about injustice and for equality for women and African Americans. One of her great grandchildren said this about Ida Wells. She used her gift of writing, speaking, and organizing to help shed light on injustice. She was extremely brave and held steadfast to her convictions despite being criticized, ostracized, and marginalized by her contemporaries. It touches the heart, doesn't it? And these are just a few of the amazing, brave, courageous souls that took a stand. And so, as I was researching for this message this morning, the question kept going through my mind, what can I learn from these heroes? See, these folks walked the hero's journey. What can we all learn from them? And what it takes to take a stand for something. First of all, in order to take a stand for something, we get to have a vision. We get to have a vision that inspires us, that is greater than our current circumstances, that is greater than the current experience we're experiencing. This vision, because it's bigger, calls us to be bigger. 
and supports us when we look at the risks that come often in taking a stand, especially if it's unpopular, especially if it's in the midst of a paradigm that we are committed to shifting but has not shifted. So having a vision informs our awareness and our power of will that something greater, something more inclusive, more powerful is possible. See, we have a vision, and then we have our power of will. And we talk about that as part of our 12 powers. Our power of will, folks, is foundational for any decision that we make. Because as you know, you can get discernment, something is yours to do, but until you're willing, does it happen? No. So we have a vision, and we have our power of will. And this is what Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, said about our power of will. When we will will or decree comes to pass, it is the avenue through which the I am expresses its potentiality. The will must resolutely lay hold and keep hold of the word of truth until the word became, becomes flesh. See, these heroes had a vision, and they called forth their power of will, and they stood resolutely in their knowing of what was theirs to do. They were willing. And so as we activate our power of will, that will also activates our power of strength. Strength is our strength of character is our ability to stand in the midst of whatever is around us and hold our center and hold our knowing. It supports us in being rooted and fearless and in our faith, which is the next power that's activated. When we're having our vision, when it's calling us forth, when we're rooted in our power of will, we're willing, and we're strong in that, what really grounds us in our strength is when we call forth our faith. Our faith and our knowing that what hasn't happened yet is possible. It's that assurance that what is not seen yet is possible. And when we stand in that, We hold the space for it to unfold. And lastly, what came to me is that after we have our vision, we call forth our power of will and strength and faith. We get to act, take action from nonviolence, from our knowing of peace. We must move forward in nonviolence, folks. We know that nothing was ever solved from the energy from which it was created, (coughs) ever. And so we must act nonviolently. So my question to us, to me, to all of us this morning, is where are you being called to take a stand in your life? Where are you being pulled The risk of being rejected, criticized, fired, misunderstood, shamed, even at the risk of your life, your reputation. When have you taken a stand and been willing to risk that? How did you handle that? Were you able to stand in your knowing? Were you afraid? Did you stand in your peace and your yes? I think it's really valuable for us to look at those times in our life when we've been called to make a stand and when we've taken a stand and what it called forth in us. So where in your life are you now being called to take a stand that entails risks? Now, it may not involve the level of risk that we just heard about from these beautiful heroes, but it still can call us up to be uncomfortable 
Maybe not to be liked, not be popular, risk how you look. So let me ask you these questions. Are you witnessing a prejudice in your office? Are you hearing someone being gossiped about that you know is unfair? Are you aware that someone or something is being misrepresented and that misrepresentation is hurtful? Are you aware of a social injustice that every time you hear about it, you cringe, you feel uncomfortable, you might even cry, or you just can hardly bear it? Is there something you think you need to take a stand about for yourself that you haven't yet, such as ownership and care of your physical health, to leave that unhealthy workplace, to leave an abusive relationship, to take a stand for yourself and your worth and value? What is it? Where are you being called in your life to take a stand? I just invite you to pay attention to this because, folks, as we evolve, we are called to make change. Change can only happen if we take a stand. Lasting change only happens if we take a stand. Our world is changing. How do you want it to be? Where are you being called to take a stand? So, what change do you want to see? What is yours to do to call it forth? Envision it in your heart. Call forth your power of will and your strength and your faith. Act nonviolently. And trust there's always a solution because we live in an infinite universe. There is always a solution to whatever you see you want to change. Remember last week, Gandhi said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Jesus is quoted as saying, in me you may have peace. In other words, in the Christ consciousness, whatever you choose to take a stand, you may have peace as you claim the truth of what you are and you act from that love in your heart and you stand strong in your courage and your faith. You take a breath with me. So this week, I just invite you to be in stillness and reflection about where you're being called to take a stand for change. In that awareness, I invite you to call forth a vision that you know is possible and let that energy of the vision uplift and call you in to a willingness to act. And from that willingness to ground yourself in strength, to call forth your faith in yourself and what is possible, to ground yourself in your knowing of what you are and declare that no matter what, peace is the goal. Peace is the way. There's nothing to fight. There's nothing, nothing to push against. To take a stand and know all is for you and to allow this community to support you. And I just invite you to come to the movies this coming Friday and on the 26th, so that we can continue to learn and be inspired for those that have truly walked the hero's journey. So thank you for listening. Thank you for taking a stand. Thank you for being a light in this world. We are the change as we stand in our knowing of what's possible. So let's affirm together. As I courageously stand in my knowing, I feel, express, and create peace, and so it is.